The Satanic verse goes on to say, Quran 53 verse 10, So he did reveal to his slave whatever he revealed. The prophet's heart did not falsify what he perceived he saw. Will you then dispute with him about what he saw? For indeed he saw him. Him who? At a second descent. Oops, a descent is a journey down. Near the lot tree, beyond which none may pass. Near it is a garden of abode, the seventh heaven. Therefore Muhammad's heaven is down, not up. When that covered the lot tree, which did cover it, the sight turned not aside, nor did it go wrong. I really did see him. At least I perceived I saw him. Why don't you believe me? Indeed, he did see of the greater signs of his Lord. Methinks, no, me knows, he doth protest too much, especially since we're in the realm of satanic verses and pagan gods. Quran 53, verse 19. Have you then seen or thought upon Alat and Aluza, the two idols of the pagan Arabs, and considered another, the third goddess, Manat, of the pagan deities? Manat was an afterthought because she was not part of the Quraysh bargain. Now for Allah's copy edits. What? For you sons the male sex, and for him daughters the female? Are yours the males, and his the females? Behold, such would be indeed a division most unfair. Mohammed just jumped from the devil's frying pan into the hellfires of sexism and discrimination. He is saying that Alat, Aluza, and Manat can't be Allah's daughters, nor goddesses, because they are girls. In plain English, it would be an injustice for men to have sons and for gods to have daughters because women are worthless. It's little wonder the Islamic politicians and clerics who depend on Islam for their status, power, and wealth threaten to kill anyone willing to expose this nonsense. Quran 53, verse 23, These are nothing but names which you have invented, you and your fathers, for which Allah has sent down no authority. Yes, they are names, names given to them by Muhammad's forefathers, just like Allah's name. Projecting one's flaws onto an opponent is standard political fare. They follow nothing but conjecture and what they themselves desire, whereas guidance has come to them from their Lord. Nay, shall man have anything he hankers after, whatever he covets? It sure seemed to work for Muhammad. The career move from prophet to profiteer would satiate his every craving. For example, when Muhammad wanted more women, Allah said, Quran 33, verse 51, You may have whomever you desire. There is no blame. Fortunately, we have ratted him out. This surah is as transparent as it is incriminating. Quran 53, 26, and there are many angels in heaven whose intercession does not avail, except after Allah has given permission to him whom he pleases and chooses. Those who believe not name the angels with female names. This is Quranic waffling. Muhammad is trying to please both Meccan and Muslim. He is saying that the female goddesses could be angels, and that Allah might consider allowing them to be intercessors after all. The next eight verses can be summarized by The Meccans know nothing and want everything, and Muhammad knows all and wants nothing. Then, Quran 53, verse 36. Nay, is he not acquainted with what is in the pages of the books of Moses and of Abraham, who fulfilled all that? Muhammad is admitting that the Torah was the source of his inspiration, but he doesn't know much about all that. A dozen verses ramble nowhere with lines like it is he who makes you happy and morose, before heading back to the world of pagan astrology and mythological people. Quran 53:49. He is the lord of Sirius, the mighty star the pagan Arabs used to worship. It is he who destroyed the powerful ancient Ad people, who actually never existed, and the tribe of Thamud he spared not and before them the folk of Noah, for that they were all most unjust and rebellious. And he destroyed the overthrown cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Actually, Allah didn't know their names, but the translator did. So he helped his God out, and they were added within parentheticals to the text. So there covered them that which did not cover, making them ruins unknown. The writing quality is as impoverished as the message. 
The Bible says that the ruins of Sodom and Gomorrah will serve as visual confirmation of Yahweh's judgment and salvation. The Quran says that the ruins are unknown. Since archaeologists have found Sodom and Gomorrah, their brimstone should serve as a visual confirmation that Allah is a liar. And please don't be troubled by the slur. Now that we know that Allah was modeled after Satan, it's a compliment. Quran 53, verse 56. This is a warner of the warners of old. The threatened hour is nigh. None besides Allah can remove it. Do you then wonder at its recital? And will you laugh at it and not weep, wasting your time and amusements? That's a hoot. With countless wives, sex slaves, and child concubines, Islam's prophet was the king of frivolity. So fall you down in prostration to Allah and serve. Since neither the 53rd nor 22nd surah redeemed Muhammad, we are left with the profitable prophet plan being the only viable explanation for Islam. Tabari, when Muhammad brought a revelation from Allah canceling what Satan had cast on the tongue of his prophet, the Quraysh said, Muhammad has repented. Actually, he reneged on what he said concerning the position of our gods with Allah. He has altered the bargain and brought something else. Those two phrases which Satan had cast on Muhammad's tongue were in the mouth of every polytheist. They became even more ill-disposed and more violent in their persecution of those of them who had accepted Islam and followed the messenger. The pagans had the prophet on the ropes, and they knew it. Not only had he lied and broken a promise for personal gain, he had destroyed his credibility and abandoned the central pillar of his doctrine the oneness of a spirit that only spoke to him. The Muslims who had left Abyssinia, which is today's Ethiopia, upon hearing that the Quraysh had prostrated themselves with the prophet, now approached. When they neared Mecca, they learned that the rumor of the Meccan people accepting Islam was false. They returned to their families and said, You are more dear to us. than Islam is the implication. The people reversed their decision. Considering the distances and the speed upon which news and people traveled, Muhammad may have gone as long as a year before he bailed out on the Quraysh bargain and Allah's little girls. The indulgence cost him most of his converts. This admission of failure is followed by a second variant of the satanic verses. It ends with this admission. The messenger said, I have fabricated things against Allah, and I have imputed to him words which he has not spoken. The Karish bargain and satanic verses conclude my case against the religion of Islam. As I promised to demonstrate, the doctrine has completely destroyed itself. Yet the rest of the story is both entertaining and foreboding. While these confessions from Muhammad and Allah enable us to close the books on the religious scam, accepting their guilty pleas, a new scam is about to unfold. This one is political, and this one prevailed. Mm-hmm.